Um, what's your boy's name, age, and type of cancer? Um, his name is Nick Fiorito. Um, he is now 15 and a half. Actually, he just had his half birthday. And he was diagnosed when he was 12. His um, cancer is T cell lymphoblastic lymphoma, which, uh, yeah. given the cell type, the T cell, it's closer to an ALL leukemia than. It's classified as a non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, but it's actually closer to an ALL leukemia than many Hodgkin's diseases, from what I understand. How rare is it? Um, it's not that rare. It's pretty. It's one of the more common cancers at Sloan. But in the world? Um, well, obviously, pediatric, all pediatric, pediatric cancers are rare, but it's definitely one of the more common ones. So and it's more common with boys, um, teenage boys, it's most common. And he, he's the youngest that we have met at Sloan, the youngest boy that has it. And we've only met one girl diagnosed with this, this disease. Nick was at the beginning of sixth grade, so he was 11 and a half. And for a couple months, he kept coughing and telling me he was having trouble breathing and I took him to the doctor and they thought maybe he had bronchitis. They had him on antibiotics and that didn't work and I brought him back to the doctor again and they put him on an inhaler. They thought it was maybe asthma. Um, I called the doctor. The doctor was actually getting annoyed with me because I kept pestering her. I thought there was something more to this. Um, she actually got angry at my son because he wasn't using his inhaler properly. Which now that I've been in nursing school, um, one of the things that was happening, which I was not aware of, is a lot of fluid was building up around the heart and lungs. And the doctor really should have been able to hear the fluid build up, the heart and lung sounds, which she didn't pick up. Um, she should have been able to assess when he used the inhaler that it wasn't working. Usually when you use an inhaler, it does work pretty quickly. It wasn't working at all. Anyway, finally in February, so this started I guess in October, November, by February we, we said, you know, we need to have a chest x-ray done. And um, we, immediately we were sent to the emergency room for a chest x-ray. Um, it was obvious very quickly to the emergency room doctor that this wasn't just nothing, that this was something. And they, they didn't want to label it anything yet, and um, very quickly it became apparent to me that this was something serious. Um, they did a chest x-ray um, and then they did a, a CAT scan and his entire upper body was, was cancer. It was, a, it was, at the time they called it a le leukemia, they didn't know how to um, classify it. Uh, we were sent to um, a, um, Morristown Memorial Hospital from the emergency room in Summit where they, they confirmed that it was T-cell lymphoblastic lymphoma. Um, there was so much fluid buildup around his heart and lungs, they had to do emergency surgery to remove it. And we just weren't comfortable having it done there because they just, you know, I, I've had experiences at Sloan before and just decided if I'm going to deal with cancer, I want my son to be at Sloan. They rushed him by ambulance that night at 10 o'clock at night into Sloan where he was met by um, Dr. Who's the surgeon? Dr. LaCaglia. Dr. LaCaglia who thank God he was there, they performed surgery. I met with Dr. Steinhertz, they, they explained to me what we were <clears throat> focusing on. I mean, they actually told me he might not come off the table. And because his, the tumor was so large, it was compressing his trachea. Your trachea is round, it was compressed like this. They could not give him any anesthesia, any sedation, nothing. They were concerned he, he would you know, go into respiratory distress on the table. And um, they, they did the surgery with nothing. They had to have doctors and nurses holding him down. They had to go in around his heart and his lungs and remove all the fluid. Um, <clears throat> thank God he survived that. No anesthesia? Nothing. Going the tubes cut into his chest, going all around his heart and lungs with nothing. And um, actually the anesthesiologist came to his bedside the next day crying and said that in all her years at Sloan, she had never had to put a child through what she had to put him through that night. They started him on chemo that night, and um, that's how our story began. We were in the, pack, the children's PACU for a week, 
and um, we started on the what's called the New York 2A protocol. It's a two-year treatment for they use it for ALL leukemia and for T cell lymphoblastic lymphoma. <clears throat> and for how long have you been under treat in treatment? He was treated from February 2010 through April 2012, and now he's 14 months off treatment. And so. He was actually, the science started in September 2009? I would say, like, they they started, like, very mild ones in October, probably, 2009. And you ended in 2012? We ended in a April 2012. When he was declared cancer-free? Yeah. Actually, with leukemias, they go away very quickly. Um, like, I, I like to equate it almost to, like, soap bubbles. They took x-rays on a daily basis, and you could see the... It was in the peritoneal, I never say that word properly, cavity, the whole upper part of his body. It almost just dissolves, and you can watch it dissolving. And they actually, it should go away very quickly if you're responding to treatment. I think his was gone within three weeks. Completely gone. Nothing that was detectable. What other than, what? so what type of treatment did he get? other than chemotherapy and surgery? Um, well, he had the surgery to move the fluid, the, the chemo, and then he had cranial radiation because at that point he was a stage four. So he had cells that had spread to his spine and because it was in the spinal cord, um, they treat, they gave him cranial radiation, a very, very mild dose for two weeks. He had, I think, 40 seconds a day for 10 days. Okay. and. You mentioned something about un, um, other medicines you got. Oh, do you want all the chemos, all the drugs? No, so other than drugs, you mentioned steroids? Oh, well, steroids actually at very high doses, steroids are very toxic to B cells and T cells, so they're used in the leukemia treatments. because During, they, the, during the chemotherapy? Yeah. Well, they're considered a chemo. When there's at such high doses, they're considered a chemo, steroids. But steroids are very... Probably of all the chemos that he had, for him, they were the most damaging long term. Okay. So he was declared cancer free at um, early 2012? Yeah. Well, they never really use the word cancer free. That whole cancer free is very ambiguous. You never. Yeah. Even the word remission, I found, they really didn't use, they didn't really use that terminology. They haven't seen any signs. Um, they haven't seen any signs. There was no detectable cancer within the first month of his treatment. Okay. So now we are in June 2013. How is he doing? He actually, a lot of the kids after the induction phase, the induction phase with the leukemia protocols are just brutal. I mean, they just, a lot of the kids, they're, they become very neutropenic meaning that all their white blood cell counts are so low, they're very susceptible to infection. A lot of them are in and out of the hospital because they get other infections along the way. He, in particular, had was um, a ha much harder time with the treatment than most kids. He um, um, was, his platelet count was low on numerous occasions. Well, also, in addition, one of his, um, when, he, when they did the surgery, he got a blood clot in his femoral vein. So he was on Lovenox injections for the blood clot for two years in addition to the treatment. So he just had a lot more um, issues and side effects than most of the kids do. So he was at, because his platelets were so low with, after the chemo and being on the Lovenox, he was at very high risk for bleeding. So um, he would get nosebleeds and we would be in. He would get fevers anytime he had you know, really low counts and he got a fever, we were in, I'd say the first six months he was inpatient, you know, it seems like we were in and out, two weeks in, two weeks out, two weeks in, two weeks out. So today he's being treated for the side effects? Well, the yeah, the, the, the biggest um, side effect and the, you know, the most long-term issue is it's something avascular necrosis from the steroids and he a lot of the kids get it some kids just get it in their hips and the interesting thing about that at the oncologists only recently are they saying that they're seeing parents um, be more proactive and look to treat it in the past they've just kind of watched it heal and they seem pretty confident that it will heal 
although they do agree with me that Nick's avascular necrosis is significant, much more significant than anything they've seen in the past. Occasionally they'll see it in one joint, maybe an ankle, maybe a knee, more often than not a hip. My son has it in both shoulders, both hips, both knees, and both ankles. Mm -hmm. So we're spending a lot of time at hospital for special surgery now, trying to be proactive, hoping that it heals to some extent. So all, your bones are actually living tissue, and they have, they're vascular, they have a blood supply. And avascular necrosis is the loss of that blood supply, so the bones become very brittle, and the joints, they break down. So instead of having a, you know, a round joint and a round socket, the bone becomes brittle and it breaks down with use. Uh, it's T-cell lymphoblastic lymphoma. Uh, it's different than a B-cell. From what I understand, T-cells are a little harder to treat because the T-cells are, I don't know, I heard Dr. LaPaglia refer to them as tricky T-cells. Um, what about the disease? Well, as I said, it's very similar, more similar to an ALL leukemia than other Hodgkin's. It, it is classified non-Hodgkin's. Um, you know, I didn't really look to a lot of resources. I, I, researched doctors and wanted to find the doctor who had the most experience and um, everybody referred me to Dr. Peter Steinhertz at Sloan. Um, what else? Is this a blood, blood cancer? Yeah, it's a, it's a blood cancer. It's different than leukemia is more in the blood whereas lymphoma is more in the lymph system which the lymph system is kind of like the um, kind of cleans out the blood. It's kind of like the waste Product of the lymph but it, 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 the, the cells go so crazy that, like my son had all this fluid build up, it just starts to interfere with, you know, the, the body systems. Like with him, it was compressing his heart. It was, you know, compressing his trachea. That's what eventually, if he had died without any treatment, his trachea would have been compressed. He wouldn't have been able to breathe because it just... So the... The lymph nodes just grow um, tremendously. If if you saw it on an X-ray, it almost looked like a big cloud. Like there was just it was just taking up space. Just the lymph nodes themselves. E well, even like I guess the whole it wasn't just the lymph nodes. It, it's I guess it follows the I'm not even really sure. Okay, but uh, so is there a tumor to be removed? No, there's no no tumor that can be removed. It almost, if you watch it on an x-ray on a daily basis, it, it almost dissolves. Okay. So the treatment is chemo, only chemo? Chemo and uh, radiation. They, it, if, it, if you have a stage 3 or 4 and it has split, sp spread to the spinal column or the brain, then you, you need some okay. sort of radiation. You know, I just got on the web and read every, everything that I could read. I can't think of one, there really aren't a lot of websites, they're really, you know, pediatric cancers, there's really, if you spend a lot of time on the, I mean, I would get up every day and read for an hour or two every day, and there, there really is no specific website that will give you, there's a lot of articles, and a lot of them are so, you know, they're something that the medical industry would, I mean, it, it's, it's more like to, researchers, yeah. et cetera. There really isn't. So there's no Facebook group for T-cell? No. Not that I've found. So where would the parent find the most relevant information if he wants to learn about this disease? You know, other than your story and maybe other... Where would the parent go? You know, I, I, there really isn't. I mean, you can comb the web and just put in T-cell lymphoblastic lymphoma and there's not even... I've probably read every single article on the web ten times each. There's really not a lot. And there's not a lot of, I mean, you'll see from 1999, maybe every year, one article. There's there's not a lot. I mean, you, you hope to get it from your doctors, but unfortunately I find they don't like to give you too much because I think they think it scares the parent. Too much information. Yeah, they give you just... What's the from your knowledge, the best doctors and the best hospitals and the best medical centers for that specific type of cancer? Oh, uh, well, thank God I'm in New York and that I did end up at Sloan, but I guess if I, 
Uh, I mean, I've heard very good things about St. Jude and also very good things about Children's Hospital in Philadelphia. CHOP? Yeah, CHOP. Uh, can you mention specific names of doctors that you could recommend on the um, positive stuff? Not no, I mean, only, I only know Dr. Steinhardt. Dr. Steinhardt, okay. Um, for a, Dr. Steinhardt would be your recommended, the oncology you would recommend. Well, yeah, and he also works with Dr. Shukla, who, you know, when you work with a team at Sloan, you you spend two years with these doctors. You, like Dr. Peter Steinhardt is much more conservative than maybe his protégés who are Dr. Shukla and Dr. Kobos. So you, you kind of learn who to go f to for what. And it's nice to have all three of their opinions. And as a parent, then you really kind of have to s decide what's best for your child after you get those opinions. And for me, you know, being in uncharted territory, I kind of had to say, well, I chose this doctor who seemed to be the best. I mean, I did have other doctors named three years ago, but now I've forgotten them. And for me, I had to say, well, I've chosen this team. I have to kind of put my faith in them and hope that they're going to do the right thing. How many other parents <coughs> with a similar type you've met, and you probably compared stories, etc. how many similar patients you have met? And from that, what's your experience about the path you chose? Oh. Um, well, I've probably met 10 families that have this identical diagnosis. A couple of them did not start out at Sloan. They started out elsewhere and ended up at Sloan. And um, they had better outcomes. They had, you know, more positive experiences at Sloan. I've met actually many families, not just with our disease, but with other diseases who've started elsewhere and wish, wished that they had started out at Sloan. I mean, I, I think that what happens in the, your first month or two of treatment is, is significant. Yes, I agree. In any pediatric case. Yeah. This, the first signs were, and oh God, if I only I had listened to him that day, as he, he told me he was having trouble running. He said, Mom, I think I have asthma. I'm having trouble breathing when I run. And um, he really, he never had a fever. He didn't have any bruising. He had none of the typical signs for these, disease, this, these diseases. He just had, I, the closest thing I could equate it to would be asthma. Like a little bit of when he breathed. And we have allergies in our family. We have a lot of hay fever and a lot of, we just thought it was allergies. He had a little bit of a runny nose and a cough. Then his cough got progressively worse. And you know, me being in nursing school now, if I had known then what I know now, if I had only been able to use a stethoscope, I think I could have heard the fluid build up around his heart and lungs. And shame on that pediatrician for not detecting it because he had so much fluid build up. I mean, his whole heart and lungs were compressed. I mean, one of his lungs, by the time we got in, was actually collapsing. And shame on her for not, I mean, you're, that's one of the first things you learn even in nursing school is how to listen to heart and lung sounds. So the cough got progressively worse. And um, the first thing they did was the chest x-ray where they could see a cloud. And then they went to CAT scan to get a better picture of that cloud. And then they did blood blood tests once they went to, we ended up at the, the second hospital. So we, within one day we were in three hospitals. We, the emergency room and then Morristown Memorial where they did, there they did an echocardiogram because they wanted, they, they knew that they had to do surgery to move the fluid so they were looking at the heart and lungs to see what surgery would entail if they could even do it there. and. Um, and then I guess they did blood cells to, um, blood tests to get the differentiate. Although the, the doctor at Memorial, that, that, um, because of how it presented with the, I can, I can never say the word, the per peritoneal cavity, she, without any blood test, she knew right away what it was. Uh, going back, I mean, a parent that heard their child is complaining on, you know, asthma-like symptoms, they won't run to an emergency room and, you know, have them be checked, whatever, right? Would you have done anything different? You know, looking back on it, I, you know... Just on the diagnosis part. I, 
Well, yeah, I, I, I do wish that I had insisted on a chest x-ray when he was complaining. But, you know, I had taken, taken him to the pediatrician three times. And I have three other kids, you know, all of who have had coughs. And I've, had, I've been in the hospital with pneumonia. I actually thought, this is a pneumonia. This has to be a pneumonia. Because I've, you know, my, I've, my, my daughter's had pneumonia. And I thought, we're, we're going to probably need to be in the hospital for a couple of days. We need some antibiotics. I can't really say that, obviously, I wish I had listened to him. And I wish I had insisted on a chest x-ray, you know, in hindsight, but I can't say that he, I mean, he was, up, the day he was diagnosed, he was at baseball tryouts running around. So even with all that fluid build up, even with the emergency surgery, they told me he might not come off the table that night, that morning, he was running around playing baseball. So he was still healthy, you know, he was going to school, he didn't miss any school. So he wasn't sick enough that I would have really had any way of knowing. first surgery. That was your first uh, encounter with the cancer, right? And that was quite a, you know, straight into the fire, right? In the morning your, your, your boy is running around, in the evening he may not come up from the table. What went through your mind? What, tell us a bit about that you know, experience. Um, well, you really, you, you really, when you, you're told that your child has this, you, you really have no idea what you're in for. I mean, I would say that's almost a blessing in that you're, even though you're, it wreaks havoc immediately and you know that it's something terrible, you really just don't know how terrible it is. It almost, you, you realize it slowly. And that night, and I really, although I knew this was, was was horrible. I didn't, you know, I, I was focused on the surgery. At this point, I wasn't focused on the cancer because they, they said he might not get off that table. And um, Sloan was unbelievable. Literally, we, we came from ambulance from New Jersey, and they all, the whole team met us there at the door. Dr. Steinhertz, Dr. LaQuaglia, they were waiting for us to come in. I mean, um, they were prepared to talk with us. They sat down, they gave us all the time we needed to ask all the questions and at that point we weren't talking about the cancer at all we were just talking about whether or not this boy was going to come off the table and um, so they did the surgery it took about 45 minutes um, they had to put tubes um, for the next few days even though they removed a lot of the fluid the trachea doesn't automatically decompress they had, that, that took several days the lung was um, collapsed that he had chest tubes draining for the next week, the remainder of the fluid. And um, obviously he was you know, in the ICU there for several days. Have you tried any alternative medicines or alternative treatments during your... No, you know, we really haven't, and this is one thing that I'm, that I'm read a lot about and I've talked to a lot of doctors about and Dr. Steinhertz is very conservative and doesn't believe um, the child should have any alternative medicines, any vitamins and if you think about it, a cancer cell is a very, it's, it's like a regular cell only it's a crazy cell and it's metabolizing much faster than a normal cell. So anything you give the body, the cancer cell is going to take it and use it a lot more quickly than a regular cell. So for example, folic acid is something that cells really use to divide. It's a big part of cell division. So if you give the body folic acid, the cancer cell is going to use the folic acid to divide a lot more readily, quickly and read more readily than a healthy cell. And Dr. Steinhertz is a doctor who really didn't want him taking any vitamins. You know, even eating well, you know, you, you, you read a lot about diet and keeping the body strong, but with a leukemia, um, anyway, Nick, no, Nick did, we didn't, we did absolutely nothing, and that was on the advice of our, our doctor, and, um, you know, he didn't even want him having any kind of vitamins until a year out of treatment. And this is, you know, some doctors disagreed with this, um, we chose to follow that, and now we're pursuing ways of getting his body as strong as possible to fight anything potentially that might 
happen in his future. We did a lot of alternative methods to fight to, for, for the nausea as far as, you know, you, you look for foods that keep him as comfortable as possible when he wasn't feeling well. Well, you know, when you're, first of all, his appetite was, you know, he had no appetite, so feeding him was really one of the biggest challenges. Not only that, they become neutropenic, meaning they're very susceptible to infection. So, for example, lettuce is like, you could kill him, you know, you're, so, you know, lettuce is something that potentially has E. coli, and if that ends up in his system, they don't survive when they get those infections. So, from the, you know, you can't have any thin-skinned fruits, everything has to be cleaned properly, even if he would have cantaloupe, it was a thick skin, you had to wash it properly, you know, slice it. I never used the knife that went through the cantaloupe to cut inside the cantaloupe, and um, so feeding him was a real challenge, and mostly we gave him whatever, I mean, he craved a lot of pizza, and that's not exactly nutritious, but I, you know, would just get little bites into him here and there. He, he didn't eat well, he ate terrible, and in retrospect, you know, I wish I had done a better job of that, but I mean, he went from being, he started the treatment, he was 115 pounds, within a month he was down to 70 pounds. So, well, I don't know that I would have done anything different, because I, I mean, I'm, I was constantly putting healthy things in front of him, and he just, he refused to eat them. I mean, I wish I could have gotten more fruit in him, more yogurt, more. But we know that the treatment changes the taste buds and affects everything, and nausea. And oh, the nausea. I became a, you know, the, a queen with the, you have many nausea meds, and we had our nausea cough. One thing that's very important with the anti-nausea meds, and most people, they didn't tell me this, but it's important when you know you're getting chemo, if we were getting chemo on a Wednesday, you don't wait till Wednesday to give the anti-nausea meds. You start two days, 48 hours beforehand, so they're built up in their system. And they even teach you that in nursing school, actually. But for some reason, they, they didn't tell us that, Sloan. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, it's better to have it built up in your system two days prior. Usually we started with the Zofran. And then once treatment came, then if he was feeling nauseous, we would add the Bisterol and then the... Yeah, all the fun stuff. Ativan. The thing I wish I had done most differently during treatment. In nursing school they call it the hazards of immobility. I wish I had had him be more active. He just was, he had also one of the, the in addition to the avascular necrosis, he had um, a lot of problems with the vincristine, which causes neuropathy. Uh, so he had some foot drop and it was really hard for him to walk. So A, you're very weak from the chemo. And um, because of the, um, the foot drop and the neuropathy, which, do you want me to tell you a little bit? It causes some numbness in the feet, and uh, you know the the messages don't, don't get as quickly from the brain to the feet. So walking was a real challenge. He was an, and because of you know the high doses of chemo, he was in a wheelchair for most of the first six months to a year, and then he was on a walker because of the avascular necrosis and the neuropathy. And he at you 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 don't know how quickly you can atrophy. A person atrophies so quickly, and they kept telling us to do laps. And in nursing school, they teach you the hazards of immobility. Your body is meant to be upright. Your lungs are not meant to be lying down. You get pneumonia when you're lying down. And your muscles atrophy. You can't imagine how quickly. And not only are they atrophying because they're not mobile, they're atrophying because of the chemo makes them atrophy even quicker. And I wish I had insisted on him being a little more mobile, maybe doing a little more swimming, a little more just getting up and walking around. Because now, even 14 months later, he has no muscle tone. Uh, it's very challenging for him. His and his his bones would be strong. Would be need the protection of the muscular system, which just wasted away. So just to, to make sure I understand, while your boy was you know you know lying lying down, you know had no strength to do anything, no appetite not feeling well, you believe that you should have, you know, get him up and walking a bit around and more active? More so than he was, yes. I mean, it, that, it, that, that again is very challenging, but I should have forced that a little bit more.
I'm not talking about going out for a jog. I'm talking just, you know, the occasional lap yeah. around the hospital when, while we were in. And when we were home, I, I wish I had had him. It was hard to take him to a pool because even when he was neutropenic, the pool, you know, here, there's a lot of, you know, bacteria in a pool. So, but I wish I had had him just out walking more. What was the effect on the, on the effect on the siblings and the family? Oh, it just it destroys your family. It wreaks havoc. It's just oh, well, on one hand, I shouldn't say that. On one hand, it brings you closer together. I, I will say, um, you know, for two years we really didn't leave the house. Um, my daughter, in particular, was is very close to my younger boy, and she became like a second mother. Uh, she was in ninth grade at the time, and um, actually, she just graduated last night. Monday night and she's off to Cornell so despite all of this she managed to keep her grades up and like I said she's you know now off to Cornell but um, she had no social life ninth and tenth grade she stayed home with us every Friday and Saturday night you know when all the kids were out more often than not she was home with us and you know Nick really couldn't be around people so we would go to late movies when the theater was empty and take him to a movie she used to, her and a girlfriend would take him on a ride and just drive around town and watch the other kids playing because he couldn't really be around the other kids. But at the same time, you know, she was in ninth grade and most of the first few months I was in the hospital with him on and off. Uh, she, they, she did not have a lot of parental supervision. Uh, I live in a town, I mean, I, I can't tell you the outpouring of love and support that we received. They created a website where they brought us dinner every single night for a year. And they wanted to continue after that year. I, I, you know, didn't accept. Initially, I didn't want to accept. I'm just not somebody that likes to take help. But thank God my kids had that because while I was in the hospital with Nick, I had peace of mind knowing that my two other children, my daughter was in ninth grade, my son was in tenth. At least they had a nice home cooked meal, and they weren't just food. They they came beautifully wrapped with desserts and notes and gifts. And um, I had such peace of mind being in the hospital with Nick, knowing that every night Alex and Lauren came home to one of these meals. Um, but it was hard. They, you know, were in ninth and tenth grade and didn't have a lot of parental supervision. We were very preoccupied with. And I've met a lot of parents at Sloan who their kids. I mean, my kids are doing okay now. I mean, my older son I think has a little bit of emotional issues left over from this. But I have met families where their older children really and younger children. I mean, at least for me, my kids were at an age where they could walk back and forth to school. They could come home if they were alone. I mean, you, you had a, a baby while you were. Yeah. I mean, I, I felt, I, my heart broke for the parents who had younger kids who really needed hands-on care. And you, 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 there's only so much to go around. Well, predominantly what I told you about the immobility, I would, I would have, it seems like a little thing, but it's a very big thing because, you know, you need your body to be strong and there's only so much you can do to keep it strong. And little bits along the way are, are more important than a lot later on. Um, I don't know, I think I would have also, I met people who were at my stage now who said that life will get back to normal and the entire not never it never gets back to normal or your old normal you have a new normal uh, I think I would have liked to have known back then that that was true I, I didn't think it could ever be true I didn't think that life could ever and, and I have days now where I think oh yeah life, life is a little bit normal and um, what else um, I can't I can't really think you know you have to you have to be kind to yourself. It's a very, very hard thing to go through. And I think you have to, you know, I, I've had to forgive myself a lot because, you know, I, I obviously have m much guilt not having him diagnosed sooner. And I have to forgive myself. But that's a couple of weeks, right? Well, in the beginning when he wasn't diagnosed quick enough, I, I mean, I, I, I wish I had insisted that he had a chest x-ray. But that's how long from that point until it was actually x-rayed. Oh, um, probably three months. Three months. Yeah. yeah that's significant. 
Okay, now, your story, of course, Nick's case, is not similar to other T cells cases. I mean, each one is, you know, individual. Oh, his is extreme. I mean, there, there are kids who, I look at them and I, I, nobody breezes through this. But there are kids who I am amazed, and one boy in particular I'm thinking about, his journey was much more. He was one year older than Nick. He didn't have any of the avascular necrosis. He, he was a stage one, and, and I don't really think that has a lot to do with it, stage one or stage... You were a four. I was a four. And I don't really think when you're dealing, and when you're dealing with other cancers, stage, as far as the treatment goes, what stage you're in, because the treatment is the same, almost if you're a one or a four with with the New York 2A protocol. It's the same except for the cranial radiation. And the cranial radiation, the radiation didn't really um, make his treatment that much more difficult. And the only really thing I'm worried about long term because of the cranial radiation is potentially cataracts. He had cranial radiation because they found when they did a spinal tap, when you have a leukemia you have regular spinal taps because you're always checking to see if it's in the spinal column and also potentially the brain. So they do them during treatment, it was every month. Now that we're out of treatment we still get them done. We had them done every three months and now we'll go to every six, four or six months now. Our next one will be in August. Um, so because they found a couple cells in the spinal fluid he had to have the cranial radiation. And there was a lot of, there were some doctors who, who didn't think he needed it. It was, there was a lot of discussion. And we opted to go for it because the, the risks, the risks, the benefits seemed to far outweigh the, the risks. And um, he only had, I believe it was 40 seconds. It was a two week period, five days for 40 seconds and another five days, so 10 days in total. And, um, the biggest, he was more tired during that two week period. Are you saying it was preventive? Um, it was just in case maybe there was a, s a cell that they couldn't detect in the, s the brain or the spinal column. Like, apparently radiation really kills, does a good job killing those. Because the chemo doesn't, the, you have the blood brain barrier. So chemo doesn't cross into the spinal system. So they, with the leukemias, they treat the spinal column with chemo. They directly, they inject it into the spinal column and he had the cranial radiation because you have the blood brain barrier so when you're having IV chemo it doesn't cross over so you have to treat that as well. And actually 25 years ago a lot of kids when they were first treating leukemia patients they kept relapsing because they didn't know to treat the spine and that's predominantly a lot of the kids relapse in the spinal column and also a lot of the boys relapse in their testicles. So that's, it's an, it's an area that... So the, the radiation was to the head and all the spine? Right? No, just the, just the brain, which they, they, they built a mask around his face to protect his face, and they just directed it to the brain. So the whole... Yeah. Which, you know, you have a little bit of concern about developmental, you know, learning. So far we, we don't detect any of that at all. He's, we, haven't had, we had him tested in the beginning to get a baseline to see where he was at. And now going forward, they want to test him so that he can get more time with SATs and stuff. And I've really opted not to do that. I am going to push for a longer time for him, more time for testing, because, you know, they call, call it chemo brain. He's just he's tired. He's been on through a lot. Give the kid a break. He let him have a little extra time taking an exam. But I don't notice any... Um, learning issues. He's actually doing better in school now than ever. He's matured a lot emotionally and I think, you know. Um, well obviously I, you know, choose a doctor that you're very, very comfortable with. I mean, I've heard patients, they say that they don't want to commute long distances from Jersey all the way into the city. I mean, you're yeah. Because okay. I, I know parents who are commuting from Texas. To oh, I absolutely. It's or from you, you, other countries. Japan. I mean, I know families from Israel, from Japan. But I've also met families that live down at the Jersey Shore and they just don't want to come into um, Manhattan. I mean, if your kid has cancer, that's where you want to be. Um, you know, once you pick the doctors, you really have to put a lot of faith in them. But at the same time, you really 
have to become an expert at these protocols. You have to really, I mean, there were one or two occasions where, for example, um, Nick, because um, the, the disease was in his spine, they, they use steroids. It is a part of the protocol. It is a chemo. But usually, if it's not in the spine, they use prednisone instead. But because Nix was in his spine, they used dexamethasone, which actually dexamethasone makes you more susceptible to the avascular necrosis. But there were a couple of times where the nurse wanted to give him prednisone instead of the dexamethasone, which I had to remind them, no, 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 he gets dexamethasone, not prednisone. So you really have to, even though they're very, very good, there were very rare occasions. You, you have to know your child's disease. You have to know their treatment and um, stay on top of it. You're, you're their advocate. I could not agree more. It's actually on the website. We have uh, five tips for the new parent. And we're all and we're pushing it. You are the gatekeeper, right? For all the unnecessary needle sticks, wrong medicines, you know, tests not being done properly or on time, and all that. Yeah, even now, I mean, I have to remember when his next um, set of scans are. They're not going to remind me. Yeah. Um, and you know, the other thing is, is he, you know, some of the nurses are very good at. Um, accessing them, their ports in there, and some are not. Most of them are very good. Uh, I don't let anybody touch my, my, he's been through too much. Nobody touches my son that's not going to touch them properly. And, you know, I mean, even at Sloan, even the parking attendants, they rush to our car and they help us out. Every, everybody associated with that hospital is so wonderful. But, you know, every now and then, like, we would end up in the um, emergency room because he would get in. Those doctors don't really know how to, the nurses don't know how to work with the pediatric patients as well. And I insist, no, I want somebody from pediatrics to come down and access him. Why should he have to get stuck twice? I mean, I think the other important thing is once you, you're done with treatment, what do you do? I mean, I didn't really realize, you live in the moment, everybody asked me, how did you get through this? And I really, I didn't think too far ahead because life was so challenging, it was overwhelming. I really just looked a week ahead of me. I mean, obviously you have to think about the future to some extent, but what I needed to get through that week, you know, but now that I'm 14 months out of treatment, I'm really, you know, they sit you down at a year after treatment and they tell you all the at-risks given the treatment. I mean, Nick is potentially more at risk. Not that I want to scare parents, but this is where I'm at now, 14 months later. He's more at risk for another type of leukemia for the first 10 years although they say it's a very small risk. Um, and then after 10 years, that his risk drops to the normal, whatever the, yours and mine is, his is as well, but then he's more at risk for other types of cancers. But, you know, they give you a, at the end of treatment, after, you know, you start to see an endocrinologist who follows, follows you, and they give you a summary of all the drugs he's had, and for example, one of his main drugs is, is drugs is doxorubicin. And, um, that causes potential heart damage, and even though it may not be picked up on an echocardiogram, it could be m small microscopic cell. And actually, one thing they never told me during treatment, which they said, I don't, maybe they did, and I was just so distraught I didn't hear it. Get, if you're on this particular drug, you're not supposed to ever lift more than 10 pa or 30 pounds because you know you don't want blood pressure spikes. And he's been going to physical therapy, lifting more than 30 pounds the entire two years. And now we're really kind of, you know, deciding whether or not we need to, I mean, that's not a lot of weight. And how can you get your body back in shape if you can't ever, I mean, I'm not saying that I want him pumping iron, but um, his backpack weighs more than 30 pounds. So, you know, you, you, at the end of treatment, you get the summary of all the potential risks with all these different drugs. Um, some of them have much greater risks than other, than other drugs. And you really have to be on top of that. And, it's a, once your child has cancer, it's, I mean, the rest of his life, you have to really monitor every organ. Yeah. Life will never be the same once your child had cancer, no. even if he's after treatment, definitely. Oh, well, just touching on, you know, end of treatment, you know, Nick and I were all excited to have a party to celebrate when we were done, but 
when it actually rolled around, we were, we were actually both really depressed. You know, I mean, A, we, we were worried because you lose, you know, when you're undergoing chemo, you have the safety net that it, you're not going to relapse, but then you lose that, and we were terrified. You know, we had scans every three months, and every three months as they rolled around, literally petrified. He was petrified. Uh, he had a lot of, you know, emotional problems. Um, you know, he had panic attacks at night, and um, we expected to just be elated and so happy, and we weren't. We were really depressed and really scared. And it took about every every three months, it got a little better. And you know, now 14 months out, I think we're the year scans. I didn't really worry about. I mean, you always worry, but I it, the worry wasn't debilitating. I didn't. We didn't slip into depression by the 12 month scans. Um, so I guess on an emotional level, I would say that. Um, no, you just, you really have to just, like I said, just be, you know, educated and read as much as you can, talk to your doctors. My experience at Sloan is they, 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 they gave you the bare amount of information because you have parents that run the spectrum who don't want to know anything and they just, it's too much and they just want, just tell me when I need to show up for my treatment. Even my ex-husband was like that. He didn't want to know anything. It was just too overwhelming. To your parents who want to know everything. They want to know everything. I wanted to know how the cell divides on every level. I mean, one thing I, I, I can tell you about the cell if you want to know anything about the cell. It's a very complex. One thing I didn't know, all I learned about the cell, one of the last things I learned is that a cell can be dormant for many years where it does not dividing at all. And that's the really scary thing because with a leukemia, if you have one dormant cell that's not dividing, you can't kill it because only dividing cells are killed by chemo. So you can have a cell that's dormant for, nobody ever answered the question for me how long it could be dormant. I never had that question answered. I don't know if they even know or maybe they didn't want to scare me because if it's five years and treatment ends in two, that cell comes out of living three years down the road and obviously this is a very rare thing. But more often than not, one of the big worries on treatment, especially like, for example, my son's platelets fell to a very low level, so they had him almost on no treatment for three months. And the big worry with, with that in the you know, lymphoma and leukemias is that um, when you have very low doses, the cells develop a resistance with low dosing. So when they develop a resistance, then that's where you really have a lot of problems. And I didn't know that in the beginning either. I found out I had to ask a lot of questions to come to that conclusion before I realized why why are we so worried about low dosing and you know it, it took a lot of questions to come to that realization. Well, I guess there was a reason they didn't tell you. Yeah, they don't want to scare you. I mean, it's and there's nothing you can do about it. Right. And there was a very good book I read actually um, early on. It's called the bio uh, It's called The Emperor of All Maladies: A Biography of Cancer. It won the Pulitzer, I think, in 2008. I didn't real realize when I picked up the book that the thread of the book was actually leukemias. And you know, they all the same drugs that they use for leukemias now they used 25 years ago. It's just how they a treat all the side effects, which is helping children survive. And also um, things like they now know to treat the spine, but all the same drugs that they used, you know, 25, 30 years ago, even almost 50. Some of them were used 50 years ago. It, but it's how they interact, how they um, layer them, how, how they yeah. treat the side effects and symptoms and neutropenia. So that's another thing. I mean, uh, you know, so, sometimes when I speak to parents elsewhere, other countries, I tell them listen, the treatment here may be better, they, they reply, but the protocol is the same. And then I'm going, you know, it's much more than the protocol. It's mu much more than the chemo, the dosage. Right. The oncologist is an artist. Each, Absolutely. each child is a different work. Yes. It's different. It's many, many smaller and bigger decisions that need to be taken as you, as you run right. ahead. Uh, yeah, I would say that he's an artist, and even many of the nurses at Sloan that have worked with Dr. Steinhardt, the nurse practitioners, I should say, they're, you know, they're, the nurse, you spend a lot of time with the nurse practitioners, but they, you know, I would worry about is Dr. Steinhardt's making the right decision, and they, more often than not, he just, 
has a gut, he just has a feeling, he just knows this is the right thing to do with your child, tweaking the protocol for each individual patient. I, I think you're right, that's, I mean, other hospitals just don't, don't do that. I mean, when you see, you know, well, 100 we, we, patients or 300 patients or, I mean, Dr. Steinhardt has probably treated thousands of kids now. Any other hospital, maybe they treat two or three. Well, we can't know that. I mean, we don't know what's going on in MD Anderson. We don't know what's going on in St. Jude, in Chop, in Boston. Yeah. They they may also have great doctors. We we just we are just not aware of it. Yeah. No, I think that probably St. Jude. I think that from what I hear, their their doctors are wonderful and Chop. By the way, I heard that in St. Jude, uh, you will be treated even if your insurance does not cover. Oh well, yeah. They don't. Yeah. They, they don't. Yeah. They don't. It's amazing. Yeah. about the connection and relation between a parent and a child going throughout this ordeal? Well, if I can even talk about that without crying. Uh, there, there's just, you know, we all love our kids, but this is one of the things that helps you get through the treatment, not with just you and your kids, but you see it at Sloan. You, we all know we love our kids, but it almost just like blossoms when you are at Sloan. You see it with other parents and their kids and you feel it. But well, my son and I are just, you know, interconnected like, you know, um, we can almost read each other's minds. I mean, he, we have a very special relationship now. And he, of all my three kids, he's always been the kindest. I mean, I love my other two kids, but Nick's just always been a very kind. I mean, how many times has he said to me, Mom, if you ever get sick, I'm going to take care of you. Um, you know, he's... He speaks harshly to me now. He always apologizes. Um, we have a very, very special relationship. He is extremely um, full of gratitude for how well I've taken care of him. And I've seen things in myself I didn't even know were there. I mean, I could care. I, who would think I could carry a hundred-pound boy blocks? I mean, it's you, you have no idea what you're capable of until you're experiencing something like this. I mean, there were days I was up for 48 hours in a row, and, um, you know, you're just filled with so much love that you just, it's just, you can't even verbalize. Thank you for sharing. Oh, you're welcome. <laughs> <laughs>